Um, I am Christina Venegas and um, a professor here in the Film and Media Studies Department. And we've just watched Sama, which is Lucrecia Martel's fourth film. Um, and I want to introduce my colleague, Eloy Gracet, uh, who is an assistant professor in the, Sp in the Spanish and Portuguese department. Um, he knows the novel much more than me, and I thought it would be fun to um, have a conversation uh, about this with him in particular. Um, he, is, he has published uh, widely on many aspects of Iberian um, cultures, and he's now working on a group manuscript tentatively titled Modernity and Mother Tongues in Iberian Literatures. Um, other projects include the study of emotions and affects in contemporary Spanish cinema. And he's been here for three years, so mm -hmm. welcome to year. Pollock Theater. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just say briefly uh, a, a couple of things about Lucrecia Martel. Um, it's, um, in this occasion, it's um, the first time she's adapted uh, a, f uh, a book, you know, into a film of hers. The others have all been screenplays that she's written. Um, this is um, the, the first film that she made, for those of you who may not be as familiar with her work, is La Cienega from 2001, The Holy Girl in 2004, and The Headless Woman in 2008. And they all it deal with um, intense relationships um, between friends, families, and very much set. It's called, considered the Salta Trilogy, is very much set. Um, in the uh, middle, you know, sort of in the context of uh, middle class anxieties and um, prevent set and set in this provincial region uh, in Argentina where she comes from. Um, and so Sama is in part a departure from uh, some of this, but I would say not entirely. Um, this is Obviously, as, as was mentioned earlier, the film is set in the late 18th century, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I think there's many qualities that we see in Don Diego de Sama, uh, perhaps <laughs> you know, some of these isolated, frustrated, suffering characters um, that we find in some of her other films, and certainly um, in these dense uh, atmospheres um, that she's so masterful at creating. Uh, and I think that this attention to region provides, um, you know, the setting, uh, but also the potential to see something different in the world, her own provincial city uh, routines um, in the world, and for, and, and for her to see something uh, different in the cinema. Um, and that difference is perhaps most attributed to her consideration of sounds, immersive qualities, um, the metaphysical qualities of sound, and I think um, we've experienced that. I'm so glad we watched that in this theater um, because I've watched it before this, and I've seen it on a on a very small screen. And you really, the the wonderful sound system here <laughs> really gave us a very different experience. So we're not real, and, and and you know, she's talked about that inability to really resist. Um, that immersive sound, uh, quality of the sound. Um, she talks about that in quite a few of her interviews. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to um, kind of throw it over to you um, and talk a little bit about um, Di Benedetto and perhaps the beginning of this tale um, in both the film and the... Yeah, so Di Benedetto was born in Argentina, in Mendoza in 1922. And he passed away in 1986. And he just wrote five novels. And obviously, the most important one is Sama, uh, considered by s some uh, critics as the great American novel. Um, the guy was uh, taken by the government of uh, General Videla in 1976 during the dictatorship in Argentina and released and tortured and released one year later and that was right after he wrote his Sama in 1956. He left the country, he went to Spain, he spent like kind of five or six years living in Spain and the United States later 
and he came back to Argentina in 1984. Um, so the novel is a little bit different because what we see in the novel is three different parts, three different sections, organized by dates. So the, the novel started in 1790. The first part is basically focused on um, emotional and sexual encounters. Um, and yeah, emotional, let's say, conflicts. The second part is set in, in 1794 and basically is based on the financial problems that he has. And we also see this in the, in the movie. And the third part is when he joins the mission to, ca um, to catch and uh, to chase uh, Vicuña Porto. Huh? And uh, this character that's so important in this movie, actually, in the, in the novel, it's not that important. It just appears at the end of the, of the novel. So it's just an important character at the end. So it's not this myth that here we see from the very beginning when mm. they start talking about him as this guy who died like 1,000 times um, from the very beginning of the movie. Um, yeah, so this, I would say that these are like mostly the, the most important um, differences. So the, the, the book is not that dislocated. And uh, as we can see here with the sound and the plot, it's not exactly the same because as we have been talking about that, uh, so um, um, Martelli was not that, in, for her it's not that important to tell us the story, but to show us the atmosphere. Uh, and what she wants to bring us is this um, humidity of the, of the Asuncion, where the, where the film is set. And that's why I think the first shot is really important because when the movie starts, we can already see everything and all the important topics that the, go the movie is going to address. Mm -hmm. In that opening shot. I mean, it's interesting. Um, I mean, she's, I guess people have asked her why adapt this, you know, what was, because it's an interior novel and lots of dreams are narrated in the, in the story. And um, one of the, the <coughs> questions is how to attack you know, how to approach such a difficult project. And, and one of her responses, which really struck me, was that it's not really difficult, you know, to do this adaptation if you were thinking about the narration rather than the story. Mm -hmm. um, so she's telling the story of this guy, but, but her approach to it was not to become anchored in the temporal kind of dimensions of the book. Um, and so we have absolutely no references to other than the the kind of costuming and obviously a colonial period of some mm -hmm. sort but beyond that it sort of floats in this space um, you know that's not giving us a particular date and time um, of any uh, particular moment and then a lot of things that she purposely removed um, which were references that would have further kind of conditioned our um, response to the period, like no references to Catholicism and direct references to religious order and church. And although I did hear some bells in the background, um, but, it's, but it was very distant. Um, and so it's a very purposeful kind of omission of certain kinds of references to construct a time period. And I, I, and I feel like it creates an anachronistic and it creates anachronistic experiences at times, right? Um, yeah, so I see that he tries to avoid all the references, but at the same time, the movie is about connecting the decline of the Spanish Empire mm -hmm. and the personal decay. So let's say like the character and the, the, the empire are decaying at the same time. So mm -hmm. we can feel this, and I think that for... for, for uh, for Martel, one of the most important things it was to just connect these two ideas, like the personal and the and the I mean the general the, the big history with the mm -hmm. with the capital H and the the personal history of Sama. Right, um, and 
But it begins in the same way, right? I, like the book and the, the, the novel, I yes, mean, the, the novel and the film begin exactly in the same exactly way. Exactly in the it's same way. He's walking around and... In front of the in front river. Of the, and, uh -huh. and we see him like looking at the horizon. And it's important to say that the novel is in first person monologue all the time. And I think she gets to transfer this idea that obviously it's not possible to do, even if she uses voiceover sometimes. When she, for instance, tells the story of the, the fish. Mm -hmm. um, but she doesn't use it so often. But she creates this atmosphere that we feel what he thinks all the time. So we are actually inside Thomas. Uh, mind, I mean, at least it's the feeling that I had after watching this movie a couple of times, is that we know what he thinks, right? His desires and the desire, the part of the hope and the desire, I think is one of the most important parts of the, I mean, topics of the, of the movie. Um, and and uh, in those first few pages where he, um, in the book it's described, you know, where he sees these women who are Bathing by the river, and they're covered, and they're you know sort of covered in mud, and and, and you hear the the playful <coughs> conversation, uh, the different languages, but they're not. And 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 as I recall in the book, the woman who runs after hit after him after the voyeur, um, after he's named the voyeur, is not an Indian woman. It's a it's it's not an indigenous woman. It's a white woman, right? Mm -hmm. So is that something that's carried out throughout the whole? It's a, it's an interesting. That's change, really interesting right? because what happens in the novel is actually what Martel does. Is she changes some of the white characters and she puts some Indians. For instance, the at the end when we see the Indian and ask Thama, do you want to live? Uh, in the novel, it's a, a, a white boy. I mean, Di Benedetto describes him as a white boy. Mm -hmm. And also his wife, um, mm. his, I mean, let's say second wife, he's not a, she's not an, an, an Indian, she's a white woman called Emilia, and she has a child with him. So mm -hmm. I think Martel at some point transforms the novel into a Colon I mean, the topic of the colonization, it mm -hmm. becomes more and more important in the, in the movie. And it was not that, actually it was part of the, obviously, of the, of the, of the, of the book, but not, maybe not that important as it is in the, in the well, movie. Well, it takes on a whole other life in uh -huh. the way that it's um, cast, in the way that the frame is filled with, you know, different colonial bodies in different parts of the frame. They're constantly there. Um, in the foreground, in the background, mm -hmm. you know, really creating a different um, sense in the interior spaces as well as outside. But mm -hmm. it, you get the sense of um, lots of activity that he cannot control, that he, you know, that, it, that, that very much becomes part of um, this, you know, world of the, col of the colonized and the colonizers, mm -hmm. right? Um, in, in in, in the way that the film is shot, in the way that we hear the film, um, it takes on a whole different dimension. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that the film is... Uh, so we, we look the landscape from a point of view of a colonizer. But actually the colonizer, this Diego, Don Diego de Zama, it's, he's colonized himself by the empire. So, everybody's colonized over there. Mm -hmm. So I think colonization is everywhere in the movie. And mm -hmm. I think that's really interesting how uh, Martel uh, achieved that. And uh, it's very, you have this feeling of um, uncomfort. It, ev everybody's uncomfortable, even the, the colonizers, right? Mm -hmm. So nobody knows exactly what to do. And in this second part of the movie, for me, it's pretty interesting to see how it becomes an existential movie. So he goes through an existential crisis and uh, this um, decay of the empire becomes um, an existential crisis where Zama, he doesn't know exactly who he is. He starts asking himself, what am I doing here? Who am I? I am an American working for this Spanish crown in the middle of nowhere, this Asuncion Paraguay that at the time was a backwater of the Spanish Empire. So um, that's interesting to see how 
all the 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 movie is full of um, yeah, colon is colonized actually. So, and I found myself really thinking about the, the it, in in the beginning of the film where um, we have the arrival of you know the Oriental um, who then dies, um, but that arrival then is leads into this celebration, this kind of social gathering where um, you know. People are dressed in their formal and, and party attire and wearing the wigs and the, you know, the, fa the fancy dresses are brought out. Um, and there's this overlapping, um, <laughs> I guess, this is overlapping uh, action going on between trying to hold on to the costume or, or the, the costumbres, the um, Customs, thank you. <laughs> thank you, all my Spanish speakers. <laughs> the, the customs, as well as the costumes. Um, and, um, you know, so there's both playful and pathetic um, in that party scene, and people are being announced and coming in, and then we have all the animals. Um, I, and I really want to talk about the animals, because they're just animals everywhere. Um, and, and I was thinking here at the end, you know, with the, the horse looking at at, at us. <laughs> and the Yama, you remember and the, the scene. Yama. So, but, but in that first scene, you know, where that celebration is, or that social gathering is going on, um, I don't know if you remember the moment, but it, it was sort of like this moment of hopefulness and levity um, that really begins this very, very tragic downward, well, the, the tragic downward fall is, is continuing, but it's, it's sort of like this moment at the beginning of the film where that seems to be um, you know, trying to still hold on and replicate to mm -hmm. some of these things. Yeah, that's interesting. And when we know that he's falling in love with uh, Lu uh, Luciana, actually, Luciana, exactly yeah. at that moment. And the, the, the sound and the music is also interesting over there, because if you remember, as a friend and colleague told me right now, is like this song, like a bolero from Cuba called yeah. Marta. And it's completely dislocated because we are in the 18th, when, when in the 18th century <laughs> and then we're listening to this music from the 20s. So mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. actually the, that's the what, anachronistic, uh -huh. yeah. The, yeah. He's, she's deliberately inaccurate. She's mm -hmm. looking for this idea of like creating these atmospheres and it's the only thing that she's looking for and not the plot or not following the ideas that Di Benedetto was trying to to show in the, in the novel. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so that, um, I don't know, I, I sort of saw the animals this time around. I, I started thinking about the animals in, in, in connection to um, the sounds. Obviously, the, there's this deep connection to all of the sounds that we're hearing, the, the insects, the birds, the et cetera. Um, that create this really, really, really dense atmosphere, but it was also sort of these, the yamas, the, um, the goats, the horses, the donkeys, um, but very much inside the domestic spaces, mm -hmm. uh, inside the bureaucratic spaces, um, really sharing space with um, all human activity. Um, so I don't, I don't know if this is part of um, something that's, that's coming out of the book as mm -hmm. well. It, it um, doesn't or that she overemphasizes at all. Um, it doesn't. It's appear. all uh, Lucrecia, yeah. Yeah, and this idea of the multilingual <laughs> aspect also, yeah. because here we hear some Portuguese, also some other languages, indigenous languages, and we don't, yeah, we don't see this in the. And it the, goes on translated, uh -huh. except at, at the very beginning. There's. It's some part of the interest actually, because they are trying to communicate, they, do, they don't find the word, so they are translating all the time. So this character in transition actually is a character in translation. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what that's why he's not getting adapted. He's not getting accustomed to, to that, uh, this landscape and right, environment when, where, where he's living. Mm -hmm, um, right. I really like about that idea uh, is the beginning, the very beginning of the movie. So the prologue before the the title, when we hear, we start the movie with this sound, mm -hmm. the buzzing, and actually when we don't know exactly where it comes from, and then we see 
just Sama walking around when the ki where the kids are on the background, and I, I was really struck by this uh, sound mm -hmm. because then completely disappears. It's gonna come back later, yeah. but over there it doesn't make any sense to hear these insects. Um, and I was really struck by that. And I think that this first shot is pretty important because over there we can already see the three main topics of the of the movie. So the idea of, as I was saying before, the idea of desire. Um, the idea of the waiting, mm -hmm. uh, the, idea, the idea of the margins as opposed as to the general, and the idea of the um, deterritorialization deterior, or the idea of the coloni coloni colonization. So, mm -hmm. and we use, when we just see the prologue, we already have in our minds all these. Um, all these uh, topics and themes that are going to be developed right. afterwards. And it's exactly the same. Actually, this first shot, I think it's connected to the last one, mm -hmm. when Sama is um, in the boat. In the boat. Yeah, I think we can already connect this first shot with the last one, and more or less we can appreciate what he has uh, become. And and the, and the scene, I think, that follows that social scene that I was talking about is when he goes to visit Luciana mm -hmm. and she talks about you know her cups and glasses that arrive wrapped into the mm -hmm. in the newspapers from Buenos Aires and so describing you know in another way that that distance um, from Buenos Aires and how far away they are and they, and they need and they then they break out into you know clapping and the clapping is really loud um, which is an absurd kind of thing, and then you realize that the significance of the sound, both for their isolation <laughs> and for the hearing and, mem and, and remembering through that clapping some kind of activity associated with the theater and mm -hmm. that kind of bourgeois culture. So it's all sort of loaded and packed into these sounds in that sequence. And the talking about, you know, yeah, when news arrives and, and which news preceded, yeah. Um, they universe. are looking for emotions, actually. That's exactly what happens in the novel. They are looking for emotions. They need uh, something to happen, and he's by himself, alone, without his wife and kids. And the same with Lu Lu Luciana, actually, more or less, it's the same situation. We never see the, the Marquez, right? Mm -hmm. And they are looking for emotion. That's why the desire is like this motif that appears all over the... the uh, mm -hmm. the movie and this idea of like clapping and talking about dreams and uh, the drink and the trips and how Europe is, right? And they say something mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. yeah. the only, I mean, the guys who remember Europe, I mean, I don't know exactly what they say, but try to connect the idea of Europe with the idea of imagining Europe. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, I think it's, yeah, what you can do over there in Asuncion is just to project your your dreams is, is what he does, waiting for this tramf, transfer that never, that they, never arrives, yeah, right? Yeah. And that's why he's gonna join later on the, the mission to, mm -hmm. to chase the Vicuña, right? Yeah, Vicuña Porto, to finally go back. Um, and I was thinking, because she's been asked uh, in interviews about um, the dreams and what, or she, I guess she was asked what would Di Benedetto say <laughs> if he saw the film and, and she said something like that I may have, I might have, should have included more of the mm -hmm. dreams and it, it occurred to me um, watching at this time, there are those, it's like three or four different moments where um, he's being given bad news. He's being denied the letter or he's being shoved aside. <laughs> In those moments, the sound that takes over is this high screeching, pit, you know, high pitched mm -hmm. sound that, that begins to drown everything out and, and, and he, you know, and I thought, oh, you know, in some ways it's sort of like, <laughs> I don't know when they would occur, but but it, it's taking him completely into another state. Um, and that sound, the overwhelming sense of that sound, completely overwhelms him and, and you know, continues to underscore what's happening and this kind of removal of him that's happening in the story. Yes, he says that 
that Di Benedetto would have liked to her to include the dreams. And, uh, and I think that actually it's really interesting the, the, the novel because he follows the ideas that he sees in his dreams. So what he does, how he behaves is connected to what he dreams. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. these visions actually are um, really important in the, in the novel. Mm -hmm. We don't have the dreams here, but obviously we have these sounds that sometimes substitute. This and we idea. have the animals. We have the animals <laughs> and we have this ambiance and this hypnotizing uh, landscape with the sounds and we feel that we are in the middle of something mm -hmm. that we don't understand and probably the, the, the animals help us to, to create this absurd situations, mm -hmm. also connecting to, I think, sort of the Beckett, the waiting for Godot, something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that she was thinking uh, about this when she was, I don't know, shooting the, the film. Yeah, so probably the, the dreams are not explicit, but are over there. Huh? And we can feel that, yeah, that's when, when I was saying that, uh, sometimes I had the feeling that we were, we were inside his head, I was talking about, about this idea of like, I think the, the sounds are really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, and some of these, of these shots, when he's, we see his back, then we never see his gaze. Right. And that's also a thing, it's this yeah. idea of like getting something that it's not obvious, that it's not explicit, but something that is hidden, something that is behind. Him. Yeah, there's quite a bit of that, of seeing him from behind actually. Um, and then, it, and, and I think, I think um, the, um, you know, the way in which the, the moment when he's being removed from his house because they're going to do some kind of inventory mm -hmm. and the furniture has to be taken out and suddenly we're in this courtyard and, you know, you have the horses and the donkeys in between the furniture pieces and the chairs and you know, and 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 the bed, <laughs> the all the important bed, bed <laughs> with the four poster bed, um, that then is becomes a gift um, to the woman, to the mother of his child, mm -hmm. and then it soon becomes this thing to hang the the green cloth that's being dyed, and and it becomes not a bed at all and anymore, and and so it's this kind of transformation. Of, of things and objects that were once part of this, you know, um, world of the colonist and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, you see this kind of trajectory very physically happening throughout the film. So everybody's rejecting him, even, even the objects, right? So everybody's, mm. everything is like living and he's by himself at the end. Yeah. So, and it's a process. It starts with the governor, it starts with Ventura Prieto also, and then the house, he's expelled, kicked out. And uh, I think this process is yeah, it's part of this idea that I was trying to explain before, um, that he's, it helps him to ask about what he actually is. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that finally he's by himself, we have, and he doesn't have any, any help or objects or anything is by him. In this inn, it, nobody's living there and even the innkeeper is not there mm -hmm. and nobody wants to live in that house. So it's kind of a expelled uh, from the society living in the outskirts of, mm -hmm. the, of the city. So it's interesting how the, the, he pretends to live in a place that he knows he doesn't belong to. So mm -hmm. it's this idea of the fish, the story of the fish who's living there, even if the river rejects him all the time. It's literally, I mean, I think that it's pretty mm -hmm, obvious that yeah. it was the metaphor of the character, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it doesn't appear on the, on the, movie, uh, on the, on the novel so obvious. And then um, we get to the moment where he joins the party, the mission, mm -hmm. to find Vicuña Prieto and um, and we've spent, you know, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing moment when we get to um, out into this kind of swampy uh, river um, and they're crossing and we have the palm trees and suddenly, you know, we have this blue and this green and the light. Um, and the open space. And right? the open space and, um, and there's, there's a visual 
transformation um, that's happening at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and we have them becoming, you know, part of this um, natural space um, where then we really come in contact with all the indigenous groups or mm -hmm. the indigenous groups and, and they're both enveloped and, and overwhelmed and, and, you know, have to, it, a, a different kind of, he becomes a different, he, he, he becomes immersed in a different kind of world mm. um, completely. So I think it's important, the last part, because it's when we see is that, that this world that actually they thought they were controlling, actually they were not. Mm. And mm -hmm. um, they were trying to apply their mindset to a completely different world. And what Martels is saying, at least uh, how, how I see it, is that actually they couldn't control it because they couldn't understand it. And that's what happens with the party. They don't get what's going on. We don't get what's going on, actually. Huh? It's mm -hmm. difficult for us to understand what happened over there. Um, so she's trying to, I don't know, that's so my feeling is that she was trying to stress this um, distance. Impossibility. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Impossibility of understanding mm -hmm. the, uh, trying to de decolonizing the European uh, thought, right? So um, I think that it's interesting to see how they behave in this, they don't know how to deal with this, uh, a completely new situation for them, mm. even if they have been there for a while, actually, for many centuries. Yeah, right. So, um, I, I thought, I don't know, um, would like to kind of move the conversation out um, into um, our audience. Um, there's so much, there's, this film is so dense, um, and, and I think, um, it's it's a th it's a thrill to watch <coughs> it um, here and be able to listen to it because Definitely. I kept thinking of Martel's comments about the way she describes her um, her work with sound um, as a way to really thrust us into a different way of uh, into a different kind of experience. Not just that we hear these sounds, but it's the kinds of sounds and when we hear the sounds. Um, that we're hearing, and I and and she talked about when they were um, on location recording, looking for particular sounds of insects that were particularly strange, so that it wouldn't be something that we we would immediately recognize. So it wasn't just a cricket, like a normal cricket. It would just be odd sounds or or or, or insect sounds that perhaps sounded like something else. And she really wanted to find the sounds of insects that sounded as though they had been manufactured, you know, and so, um, <laughs> so it, it completely, you know, sort of throws us out of this kind of, oh, I know where we are, um, I know what's going on, um, forcing us into a very different um, kind of physical embodied space with what we see on screen. And I, 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 I you know, is very mindful um, of thinking through this, you know, as as we're watching, um, because they are strange sounds, intermersed with, interspersed with um, the kind of familiarity that you know that we might be able to recognize with domesticity and 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 the like, and but also um, the layering of uses of of different kinds of conversations and whispers, um, and as opposed to you know, a conversation between two people. Um, so there's, there is all this kind of layering of the experience of, I guess, um, the metaphysics of, you know, the sound experience, the, the atmospherics of sound um, are kind of interesting in the film. And I'm sure you guys um, have things you want to talk about as well. So um, if there are any questions, there's a couple of microphones out there. So this is going to be a comment, I think, that'll, that's trying to fantasize itself as a question. <laughs> um, you know, I couldn't help but think about Globa Rocha, yeah. particularly Black God, White Devil, and Antonio is Dead, the bandit figure, mm -hmm. the renegade, the pirate, the corsair, uh, the mercenary, and 
for me, what those figures do here is to show how, in spite of the vast expan expanse and the intense penetration of the whole empire, ultimately the imperial project remains deeply um, illegitimate. So the question would be, what I really was amazed by was the line that comes towards the end where Diego says, I'm trying to do for you what no one did for me. Mm -hmm. I am saying no to your hopes. No hopes. Yeah. If you could speak a little bit about that, whether that was in the novel. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, it was in the novel. Uh, yeah, it's in the novel, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. Uh, Sure. I mean, yeah, that's uh, an important part. And actually, for me, the hope is pa it's one of the most important topics covered in the um, in the in the novel. Uh, the fact that he cannot leave the place, I see it actually. On the one hand, it's true that he cannot go back to see his family and live with him, with them. But on the other side, he's the he has the opportunity to live and to desire, and it's always uh, something that is going to be really, really important for him. So, um, yeah, he he doesn't have hope, but finally. He looks the way to find how to deal with this lack, and uh, I think this this is the most important part of the movie. When we see that we're, that the movie becomes a, a way of showing his existential crisis, maybe this question or this comment at the end is a way of recognizing all the process he has been through. I don't know. I have probably am not answering the question, but it was, um, yeah, maybe I was trying to connect the, the idea of hope with the last, I mean, with the, with the, with the, with the line. Um. I know, it's also like projecting a future. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of the, the, the lack of projection of that future in a way um, that, that's what it struck me as, you know, it's, it's not even, it, yeah, it's, 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 there's, there's sort of this stasis, um, but, but it's the projection that he always had, the imagination, the hope for, the, ex the expectation, mm -hmm. the anticipation that there would be some kind of um, reward, um, but also a, a, a life beyond what he could live um, in, that, in that space. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I haven't thought that really through, but it struck yeah. me as that. It struck me as this inability to really think of the future. Um, and, it, and I guess in that sense, it would connect to the stasis of the place, the, the waiting for, for that which never comes, and, and, and connected to a vision of, of empire. You know? I w wanted to ask you uh, about the character of the writer, who seemed uh, to be such a fascinating character uh, and kind of anachronistic. And under those conditions, he was he was writing his book, and um, I kind of lost track of whether the book uh, survived uh, somehow. He seemed to s survive, and, and of all, all the characters. Uh, he seemed to have a kind of uh, energy and vitality that wasn't kind of enervated by the fetid, you know, uh, atmospherics. I, I was so struck when he jumped over the fence mm -hmm. uh, there. Nobody had that. He just had his youth. He had his energy uh, and, and everything. Um, and it seemed a little anachronistic in the in the movie to have a, no a novelist going on. I just, uh, <laughs> um, if we, uh, what can we possibly imagine he was writing about? Was he, and whether it embodied the, the, was that there in the, no in the novel as well? He seemed to be an unusual uh, 
Yeah, it could be, Un po it could be possible. Was there, <laughs> huh? Was there stuff about the coconuts? Was there stuff about the coconuts? Yeah, he was writing about the coconuts, and the, I think maybe the character is used to, you know, um, to oppose the reality and the sad reality with the imagination, actually. And at that time is the romanticism, so it would make sense that the novelist is writing what he's not living. So maybe this character is useful to show that the world doesn't necessarily correspond to what the work could be, actually, in the writer. I mean, the writing was the way to imagine um, this possible reality. Because if you remember well, he says something like, I'm gonna, I know what the book is going to be, but with my children, I don't know where they are going to become. There's something like that. So the children would represent the reality and the book, it's something that is not necessarily connected to the real world, but something that's connected to the imagination. I'm just thinking about that mm -hmm. uh, right now, but it makes sense, at least for, for as an answer, I guess. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, this is the first time I've seen it, and this is the first time I've seen a, f a film by this uh, filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the explanation that uh, you gave about the parallels and the difference between the movie and the novel. And by hearing your, exp your account of that, I kind of wonder if she actually, rather than making an adaptation of the novel, used the novel as an excuse to actually convey her own reading of what the colonial project was at particular time. And that she deliberately actually chose not to present any year in particular to actually present the idea that it was decadent from the beginning throughout to the end. And not that there is actually a moment in which the colonial project is actually going downhill, right. but that from the beginning actually uh, it is uh, provocative because it's full of violence and the violence that's continually perpetuated against indigenous and African people. But then the other aspect of it that I found really interesting is that as compared to you said that in the book, these um, people of color, if we want to call it that way, uh, are not so prominent as in the film, that she's actually trying to make a statement. Uh, Salemba actually cannot really speak, but she can communicate. And her eyes are saying way much more that what we, I mean, sometimes we don't even know how much she's saying because she's looking and gazing, not only at uh, Sama, but even at us and at her, her mistress. And, um, and when the indigenous actually are doing, dyeing the, the, the cloth green, they seem to be continuing their life regardless. And they haven't lost this ability of collecting this, um, this natural green dye that they are processing and making their cloth. Things are going on, and this colonial project, which is decadent from the beginning, is attempting to function while they are still continuing carrying their life. Granted, after having experienced a lot of violence. And to me, he becomes an excuse, as well as the governor and everybody else who seems to be caught up into like a mibus loop of perpetual decadency and disconnectedness and coherence as actually to me, well, the, some of slaves have to carry a work. I mean, they have to pick up the people, they have to serve, but they seem to have much more uh, a sense of purpose rather than the Spaniards that are there trying to pretend to be running something that is completely out of a logic sense of what things should be. Um, and so I'm wondering if she just used the novel as an excuse to create her own reading of what the colonial past and present um, has been and where the, 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 the characters like the Salimba and those who are African buddies actually are more central. And even the bandits are, because all the Europeans seem to be in a, in a loop that is full of violence, uh, fantasy, lies, and aspirations that cannot be met. Yeah, thank you. 
difficult to <coughs> to answer that, but yes, we could understand that she's talking about the whole process of colonization, obviously. But for me, it's important to link the idea of the, the decline of the empire and at the same time the personal decay. And I think it's difficult to see things separately. So the fact that he starts thinking about what he is and the fact that the, 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 the empire is going down, it's important to get what the movie is trying to tell us. So we shouldn't be able to, I mean, I think it's not a good idea to, I mean, at least at, uh, how I read the, the, the movie, it's uh, important not to separate both processes because it be, be take place at the same time and one affects the other. The fact that we don't know exactly when it happens, yeah, it could be because she's trying to talk about the whole process of colonization. It's a way to see it. But when I see the first image, I see something that it's uncomfortable the clothes are dirty and the wigs also, so it's something that it's decaying and I think that's the most important thing uh, that she's trying to show. I don't know exactly what she would say, obviously, um, but um, I, I could be read the, like that, but uh, I don't see it actually mm -hmm. this way. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, it's a little belated, I think. Evelyn already uh, made the point, but I wanted to actually, uh, it's just a comment on going back to the question of uh, the writer and the old colonial trope. Um, I think one of the things that I really appreciated was actually she brings up the colonial angst and then abandons it. And I kept asking Tyler, what happened to the book? No one's reading the book, what's in the book? And I think we're actually not given the book and we're told to throw it out and to reconnect in this sort of sensuous way with this world that has always far outstripped the book. So I thought it was about a cinematic relationship that could undo some of those, that old colonial history that is so well worn. And I'm thinking of The Embrace of the Serpent as another film recently that also does a colonial journey but actually does it in a, you know, reestablishes a sensuous relationship mm -hmm. that you've so well articulated, Christina, around sound. Um, and that, that world is not just, you know, idealized, but it, it's hurtful. There are spider wasps and, you know, it also hurts you. So I, I really like that reconnection to the world through the cinematic and the abandoning of the print narrative, mm -hmm. which was, I think, a really strong post-colonial critique. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank Eloy uh, for joining me tonight. And I want to thank all of you for coming and for staying and talking. Thank you. Um, <laughs>